Guys, we are here to talk about leading change today. We just like to have a little bit of fun. But yeah, let, let, let's hop in. We've got a lot to unpack today. Um, Rachel, let me do some, some introductions. You want to go to the next slide? So here are our fun pictures. Josh Swing, he's an account executive here at Wild Spark. Big basketball guy. Um, he can still dunk and he's 45 years old. Uh, I'm kidding. He's not, he's not 45, um, but Josh can still dunk. He's amazing. Rachel's Jeez. our director of marketing. <laughs> Um, she is a, a dear friend and, and wonderful, wonderful leader on our team who we, I don't know what we would do without her. And then there's me, me just pretending to, to call. I don't really know where that picture came from. Um, but, uh, my name's Hampton and we're just fired up to talk about leading change today. Let's hop in. Okay. We're going to play a little game. We need some crowd participation. Trivia. Um, trivia time. So I need you to put your answer in the chat, whoever you think the answer is. So who said this? Change is the law of life. Those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. Let us know what you think. Let's see. Is somebody away from the past? Like if they said this, that would be quite interesting. I don't know. It's difficult. Any guesses, anybody? Abraham, I'm going to guess Abraham Lincoln. Honest Abe. It's a good guess. I feel like Obama's whole campaign was like on change when he was getting elected for the first time. I think it could be an Obama quote, potentially. Yeah. Well, who is it? Oh, we have one. Uh, I really appreciate the per participation here. I feel like these were these answers were slightly delayed. Maybe they're coming in later, which makes me skeptical that people Googled because they are all correct. It <laughs> is John F. Kennedy. Everyone, thank you for guessing it right. Um, I will leave uh, integrity. I won't question any of you because I'm sure you all have great character. But anyways, yes. good job. <laughs> yes, good job. Okay, next question. Innovate or die? Who do you think said this? And there are a lot of people here, a lot of options here that it could be. So this is kind of a, this is a difficult one. A lot of innovators on the list. No idea. Yeah, the guy who's trying to get to Mars, the guy who invented the iPhone. I mean, like, didn't didn't Elon just have a spaceship blow up? So it may be quite literal. Like, if we don't innovate, people will die on our okay. spaceships. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we got a lot of people thinking it's Steve Jobs. Actually, guys, it is Peter Drucker. So, hmm. author a, Peter Drucker. Yeah. Stumped all. All right, and our last. I'll take the last one. Last question here: If we get better, our customers will demand we get bigger. What famous CEO president said this? Was it Jack Welch? I believe it was former president CEO at General Electric, Jim Collins, Truett Cathy, or David Green? What do we think, people? Mm. What are we going with? What does your gut tell you? Gut tells me it's Jack Welch, but you only you know the answer. That is correct. I know the answer, but it is not. I got a guess for David Green. Who is it? Jack Welch is not David Green. It is Truett Cathy famously said this before the boom of Chick-fil-A and its growth into what it is today. So I think that's a great even segue to what we're going to talk about today because getting better implies that there is change that happens. We can't be this we can't be the person that we want to be if we continue to do the things that we do today. And so things have to change for us to be able to be that better version of ourselves. And on that note, we're going to talk about change in three different ways. We're going to come at this from, from three different ways here. The first Hampton's going to take over is, is with incompatible wishes. He's going to deliver a principle that comes from Henry Cloud called incompatible wishes and how that plays into the way that we approach change. I am going to unveil four P's of change, a framework and system to think about how do we lead change in a really dynamic way. And then Rachel is going to uh, round us out here with a really powerful mindset shift on how we view failure and how that plays into the way that we then view change. So I, I'm excited to dig into each of these things. Let's go ahead and do that. 
I want to start by giving us some quick statistics on change that recently came out. This first one says that 58% of managers say that change is necessary for their organization and team to succeed. So over a majority of managers would say, we have to change if we want to succeed as a team and as an organization long-term, which I would say they are correct to be able to succeed. You cannot stay the same. But 75% of change initiatives fail to meet their expectations. That is an overwhelming majority of change initiatives that fail to meet their expectations for a number of different reasons. But the really important thing that you'll see here is the next statistic, which says that 19% of employees are willing to take the risks needed to reinvent lead change and continue to be the better version of themselves, which is staggeringly low. 19% is a very minimal number. And so why is that? Why, why do only 19% of people uh, have the willingness to take the risks necessary to be able to lead change? Well, I'm going to keep yeah. and tell us why. I mean, what, what prevents this? We, we see the data. Everyone says that, or most people say that they want to change. Most people have goals, but oftentimes we, we don't follow through. And so what prevents people from changing is what Swing mentioned just a minute ago. It's called incompatible wishes. Henry Clout talks about this. Um, a couple of examples of this would look like, I want to lose 10 pounds and I really want another brownie or I want to invest my money and I want a new car. Or, I want to be productive in the morning and I want to sleep in. Um, so those would be some personal examples. Professionally, I want to be close closer with my work team and I also want the freedom of working from home. I want to surpass my quarterly goal and I want to take more vacation time. I want to restructure my team and I don't want to deal with the conflict it will create. Now, after reading through that list, I bet that at least one of those um, resonates with us. I mean, multiple of them do with me. And I'll introduce a principle that uh, this is kind of like a, like a motivational thing. Like if, if, you, if you want to set your alarm clock and give it a name, uh, this could be one of those things. If you're one of those people, it's three words. I would say, choose your hard, choose your hard. I can't remember where I heard this from the, for the first time. Um, but, but I think we could all agree that there's a lot of good and, and beauty in life, but there's also a lot of hard too. And most things we do are hard and usually nothing great or worth having comes on the back end of easy. Uh, and so this, this, uh, this picture here of, of tug of war is, is this example of like, um, how there, there's really pain on either side of those wishes. And so with the principle of choose your hard, uh, for example, it's I really want to go to the gym in the morning, but I also want to sleep in till seven. Getting up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym, it's really hard to do, but sleeping in at seven and then regretting that you didn't get up and doing that for 10 years, that's hard too. And so the principle of choosing your heart is saying, well, I, I think I would rather get up at 5 a.m. Even though that's hard in the moment, the, the value, what I receive from choosing that hard is, is something that I would rather have than the other one. So I think that's a principle for all of us to, uh, to really think about as we're trying to, to decide what, what, uh, which way to go. So a question I have, and I'm, I'm inviting some vulnerability here, swing me and Rachel, we may, maybe we'll participate too, but, but what incompatible wish are you holding on to? You don't have to put something in the chat, but if, if someone wants to share something, then uh, we, we'd love to see. But take, take a minute just to think about what incompatible wish you might be holding on to. I think that the thing that one that you, the, the gym one is like super relatable and easy, I think, for a lot of people. Like for me personally, my previous job, I worked from home and I was always able to like have a chunk of time in the afternoon where like I got my workout in and then when things, circumstances in your life change, right? Um, that in and of itself, that type of change creates pain and sometimes the the change kind of cascades into these other areas, right? And so getting up early and being a member of the 5 a.m. club as you know we've heard about, right? Like 
going through that change was painful, but also losing like the endorphins and like the change in your body and your energy and your ability to like better show up in your life. Right. Not having that, that's also painful too. So I feel like I can really relate to that. Um, but like, even in the workplace, I can relate to the incompatible wish of like wanting to have some safe, predictable results that might not be like the most amazing, but at least it's like, Oh, at least we get X amount of results per month versus Hey, if we change some things and we take some risks and it, we might fail, but like it could create this like exponential growth for our business. Right. And so that's an incompatible, th- those are some incompatible wishes I've had to really wrestle with. I think it's just in my first year of wild spark is like, do we want to stay in this comfort zone or do we want to really try these new things that could become failures and there's pain and having to work through all of that, but could massively pay off. Right. Hmm. It's a great example. Rachel, I think we can all relate to the health side of things, but even that specific work example was really good to hear about. And we're going to talk about how to have successful change here, how to lead change. And we're going to unpack that with four P's. And you see the P's on the screen right here. Pinpoint the pain is number one. Picture your purpose is number two. Prepare your people is number three. And then four, finally, is prune the plant. And we're going to explain what each of these means, but I have even a set of three questions to dig into each of these P's that we will internally ask ourselves as we're evaluating any type of change in our lives. So this could be, depending on where you're at in life, think about this from from different perspectives. This could be, if you don't lead a team, then it could be just a personal application perspective. So you would ask some of these questions from the first person. If it's if you are in a leadership role, if you are leading a team, a great way to think about these things is organizationally or departmentally, whatever your uh, your leadership responsibility is, think about it from that team perspective. So just two very different perspectives that you could process this through. I would encourage you to leverage both. Pick one for today, just for the sake of not like, having too many thoughts bounce around all over the place within your mind, I'd encourage you to just think about one, whether you want this to be personal or team-based, but I would encourage you to go back once we send the slide deck over and think about this from each perspective as you, uh, as you evaluate where change needs to happen in your life. Number one is going to be pinpoint the pain. And this is very, very critical. So many times I will just like drift and not even realize that I'm in pain. And so what is very, very important for us as leaders is to step back and think, and even at times think about the way that we're thinking. Why am I thinking about this in this way? What needs, how could I think about it differently? How could I think about this from a, from a stance of more empathy or whatever needs to happen as far as, as far as our thinking process goes. But this first question is great. What am I doing that distracts me from who I desire to be and what I want in life? Or if you're thinking about this from a team perspective, what are we doing that distracts us from being who we desire to be and what we want as an organization or as a team as you're processing that? So really important uh, question to ask around the distractions that may exist within your life. And then number two here, is there an area that is causing pain or tension that needs to be changed? When you think about some of the, the best inventions in the world or the, the best ideas that people have come up with, a lot of times it goes back to some type of frustration or friction that occurred, right? Netflix started because people were tired of having to go to Blockbuster and load up the family in the minivan and get everybody out at Blockbuster and not only have to buy a movie, but have to buy all the candy for the kids and, and all this stuff. And it was just such a process. They said, what if we had movies delivered to our house? And so then they started mailing you know, movies to your house. And then they said, well, what if we didn't have to mail the movies to your house? What if they were all accessible at the click of a button? And now we have right the massive company of Netflix that everybody watches shows on. But it all came from a frustration point in their lives. I know even Hampton, you're reading a book right now by Jesse Cole titled fans first i'll put you on the spot here but he, he talks a lot about reducing reducing friction or reducing tension do you have a specific example from that book that highlights the pinpoint the pain side of things that book is something else and um the savannah bananas for those of you who haven't heard of them are just uh a, a really a really cool team that it's a really cool organization they play baseball 
um, and they're really entertaining. One of their mottos is fans first, entertain always. So everything they do is about the fans. And so they're always looking to eliminate friction. Um, one story was that, uh, well, this was actually at Jesse Cole, their owner's previous organization. It was, it was another team, but they had a partnership with Chick-fil-A where you could get like a meal. You could, you could pay for food for a family for like 20 bucks if you bought a ticket to the game. It was something like that. And so a family walked up in the middle of July and with their Chick-fil-A because there was a special deal with this organization and they got to the gates and then Jesse, because it was his job, he had to say, Hey, you can't, you can't bring that food in. And so then they went and because think about concerts, sporting events, you usually can't bring food in there. So then they went and sat on the hot pavement, ate their food. And then he says he vividly remembers them looking back at the gates and looking to their car and they just walked to their car and left and they lost a fan forever. So when he started the bananas, he said, you know what? One, we're going to charge a flat fee. There's no taxes. There's no extra fees. And there's going to be all included food and drinks here. And if people want to bring in their food, they can bring it in too. And what he's found is not only some people might think, well, we're going to lose a ton of money. Well, they get way more money from their average customer than like any other team does because they've eliminated all that friction and created raving fans. Hmm. That's a really powerful example. And it even leads into the next question. What's at stake if this changes versus stays the same? Like Jesse had to ask himself a question in that moment of the what's at stake question. He even saw it play out. Like if this stays the same, we are going to lose fans. Like with the way that we've set this up, it is painful for families who are trying to feed feed their families. And so how can we reduce friction? And what happens if it changes? I think we anybody that follows the Savannah Bananas, they know that they play a tour now across America and every game is sold out before the season even starts. So pretty big difference in losing fans versus raving fans across the country. And even Zach, you pointed out a, a really good point in the comment. You were like, I think this is maybe tying back to the incompatible wishes. Like I want to be able to point out the problems, but I also don't want to be labeled as the, uh, the complainer or the squeaky wheel or the problem employee that is, uh, is never satisfied with things. I know one of the ways that that I've seen leaders overcome that is to believe to be not a uh, a problem illuminator, but a solution bringer. And so instead of saying like, "Hey, this is really painful for us," or "Hey, this is a problem for our organization," coming to the team and saying, "Hey, I've experienced this is devaluing for our team or for our customers, but here's what I think we could do instead." to be the positive change that we need to be that conversation goes a lot differently because it's, it's, you're not viewed now as just the negative, uh, the negative Ned that's bringing, you know, every problem to the, to the table, but you're, you're positive in the ideas and the solutions that you're bringing to the table that hold ultimately would lead to that change. So thanks. Uh, thanks Rachel for the book, the book plug there fans first. I would also recommend it. I haven't read it yet. I just, I sit across the hall from Hampton in our office. So like, I'm just like, Hey, what cool takeaways do you have today for me? <laughs> I'm it's good, man. I'm going to start wearing a yellow <laughs> suit to work or maybe a red one for wild spark. Yeah. I'm, you got to go red. Wear a red suit. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This may be the most important P in the whole, in the whole shebang. And it's to picture your purpose because the why is the most important part. And so pinpointing the pain, yes, is very, very important, but sometimes the pain needs to be there if it's in support of your greater vision and the noble purpose that you stand for. Sometimes we got to go through hard things to create the impact that we want to create. But what's really important is to ask that question, because if it doesn't align with the why of the organization, then we need to cut that out immediately and we need to to do things, make those changes in the areas that do align with who we are. So you've got to have that clearly defined why to be able to run as a filter for all the things that come after that. Another question is how do I envision this looking in an ideal scenario? This is, this is also a purpose question. It's thinking future. It's thinking uh, from a, a different perspective. It's casting vision on, as this plays out the way that we want it to play out, what is that 
what is that going to look like in the ideal world scenario? That way we have something to shoot for. And then this question, what could I stop doing to give energy to what is more important? This goes back into the incompatible wishes thing where what are we spending our time and energy on that is preventing us from spending our time and energy on the things that are most important and that align with our purpose and ultimately help us move that forward. And so third P we're going to move, we're going to move quickly to the next one, prepare your people. So if this is, if this is personal, this is still applicable, but just in a different way. I think it is so critically important when, whenever we undergo organizational change, the order of communication is maybe just as important as what is being communicated. The people who are going to be affected the most probably need to know about it first. You do not want them hearing about change that's happening from somebody else within the organization that it doesn't matter as much too. And so we need to think about who will be affected by this decision. So then we can clearly communicate the whys to them ultimately so that we have champions for this change on board. If it's just one person, that is why, uh, that is why change fails. When we go back to the beginning, right? The 19% of people who are, who are just willing to make the changes necessary to see the success that you want to see those other 80 or so percent, they need to be communicated with in a really clear way with the why intact so that they can buy in and you can get momentum around that change. And then uh, are the key people I need to tell first, who are the key people that I need to tell first to help with this change? Um, All three really, really important questions to think about from an internal organizational perspective, but also personally, like if there's personal change that needs to occur within your family or within your personal life. And there's other people that will be affected by this change. You got to communicate it with them if you want to see that success. So let's round it out here with prune the plant, prune the plant. So what practical things need to happen for this change to occur? How and when will those steps be taken and what accountability needs to be in place to ensure this change sticks? Even this peep pruning the plant I am not a gardener by any stretch of the imagination, but I do know from talking to gardeners that if you want something to thrive and to grow, you've got to cut off the the dead parts. You got to cut off the dead branches or the dead parts of the plant so that healthy branches can grow. And so this is where you're just digging in the, to the practicality of things. What are the, what are the very clear steps that need to happen for this change to occur. Um, I think it's John Wooden that says, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Without a plan in place, your change just isn't going to happen. You have to have some kind of strategy in place to encourage some consistency around the change. And then the account- accountability piece is could not be more important. Uh, the statistics on this were 65% more likely to follow through with the change that we want to occur if we if we verbally express it to somebody else who will hold us accountable to that change. So just by saying it to somebody else who cares about us, we are 65% more likely to go and do what we want to do to be the best version of ourselves. That number increases to 95% if we know that there is going to be time on the calendar to uh, to debrief on the things that we want to do to be that better version of ourselves, to make those changes and to lead those changes. 95%, oh, like who's not taking those odds for something that you want to see happen in your life or in your business or in your team? I will take a 95% chance every single day of the week. So those are the four Ps. Um, Hampton, Rachel, happy for you both to to dig in there with anything you wanted to add to it. But then I've got a question here in a second that I'd love to ask our audience today on these four Ps. Anything you wanted to add? I don't think so. I, I think there are a lot of, there's a, I think there's a, um, what's the last part of a book called? The begins of forward. What's the, what's the, end? I don't, there's a little bit of an epilogue or something that I think goes to the four Ps that we're going to chat about in a second about like, what do you do once you come up with your plan? But um, for me, which P I'm best at, like I'm really good at pinpointing the pain. <laughs> I would say for me, like I'm really bad at, I might come up with a plan and pruning the plant, but for those support angles of it, that's the part that 
probably gets most overlooked for me is like having people hold me accountable, having support around me and relationships around me. And even like communicating to every person that needs to know those are probably the things me personally that get overlooked because all my assessments show that I'm somebody that's just like, whether it's tenacity, the type of the type of person who's wired to take things across the finish line. When you really want to affect change, you have to take people across the finish line with you. So those are the two I would say for me. Um, when it comes to pruning the plant and I, I mean, I, I think about, I don't have a terribly hard time pinpointing pain and, you know, connecting it to my, my purpose and the why and the goals that I have. And then, um, could definitely, I, I could get better at communicating to, to the people around me before taking action. But I would say when it comes to pruning the plant, um, one, we're big fans of the working genius at wild spark and we're not going to go deep into that here today. But one of the elements of the working genius is, is, uh, someone who wonders, someone who wonders is often, you know, always thinking, how could things be better? How could I make slight tweaks? Um, and that is a frustration for me. And so I love getting a plan in place or, or, uh, you know, identifying the pain and then taking action. But it's, it takes a little bit longer for me to, to start pruning, um, on my own, because I, I just, I think that I don't like thinking about things. I just like doing because I want to feel like I'm busy and being productive. But so often, like you said, swing, like thinking about your thinking can really lead to you um, pruning the plant. Also a hack to that is inviting people into your life to give you constructive mm -hmm. feedback and to speak into your blind spots. Um, it, it's foolish to just try to do that on our own and pretty uh, egotistical to think that we're self-aware enough to know where we always need to grow and I'm speaking to myself here. So definitely inviting people in to help me prune. Yeah. I'd, I'd love to hear even from some of you that are listening right now, what, what I know Rachel, you and Hampton just mentioned part of the, the P process that you're really good at. And the part that does get overlooked, the two questions that you see on the, on the screen right here, I'd love to hear from some, some of our audience, which P typically gets the most love in this process for you and then which p could stand to get a little bit more love and attention on ways that you could grow and how you lead change so pop that in the chat as you're thinking about it with everybody pruning the plant even leads into where we want to go next um, because pruning the plant infers that there's something that didn't go right right we're, we're having to cut something off we're having to get rid of something and maybe that was a, a change attempt that went poorly or we learned a way not to do something. But Rachel, I want to pass it to you next. And this is a really important part of our webinar today to just talk about our mentality and approach to pruning and trying things and changing in general. Yeah. So I think, I know when we started Hampton, you talked about, you know, there's this phrase I've heard, choose your heart. And I've heard that a lot too. I think like in, like personal training and gym spaces that's like said a lot it's like a pretty common phrase and like another phrase i've heard that's very similar uh that i really love is are you interested or are you committed right because our brain loves to get interested in things um i don't have a bunch of studies studies to, to cite here at the moment but like our brain loves the idea of something new right so when you are considering change when you've felt a pain point long enough to where you want to do something about it, like your brain lights up at the idea of something new, but then actual long-term, you know, obedience in the same direction, right? Genuine change. It just takes reps over time, right? It, it, and if any of you do work out, you know, like repetitions in terms of lifting weights, right? Like you probably do eight to 10 to 12 reps, right? Like per set. And so like reps over time is the way that you're going to see your genuine change happen. Um, repeating what the, the pruning plan, repeating that over a period of time with the caveat that you're not afraid to fail and learn quickly from failure. So, and the reason why I say that is because the, the Northwestern University School of Management, the Kellogg School of Management, which is a really well-known business school, um, they did this study where they assessed 776 
plus thousand grant applications, right? Like they looked at grant applications over a long period of time. And they looked at 46 years of venture capital investments in businesses, right? They looked at several other things too, and really tried to do like this longitudinal study about how people ultimately succeed in these different facets. Like how can we look at these different industries and how can we look at these different groups of people and are there overarching principles about change and ultimate success um, to where we can, we can have some like principles that, that stand the test of time. And what they found by like analyzing all these data and all these change initiatives or all of these new businesses and things like that is that every winner begins as a loser. And the people who succeed and the people who fail, they do the same amount of work. They do the same number of reps. But the caveat is that the people who succeeded, they were not afraid to fail. They were willing to fail quickly and then to pivot really quickly and learn from their failure to make quick changes and iterations so that ultimately they could succeed, right? And so when you think about change, when you think about implementing change, right, you go through the four Ps, you're prepared, right? You've taken your interest and you've converted it into some form of a plan and a commitment and you're moving forward in that direction, the first thing you really need to hone in on is that, okay, I am committed and I'm going to commit to reps over time, right? But in addition to that, not being afraid to fail, you know, not being afraid for one or two things to go wrong um, and being humble and, and being accountable to others to where you can talk about it in a supportive system and say, okay, how can we pivot and learn from this and get just 1% better, right? Day over day. You know, that is really going to help you long term implement that change. And in just that in and of itself, iterating quickly, learning from failure and iterating quickly on it, that in and of itself, if you learn how to master that type of change, there isn't any kind of change in your life that you won't be able to overcome. Right. And so Ryan Leak is somebody um, he's a thought leader and a speaker that we we really are good friends with at Wild Spark. And Josh Swing in particular has a great relationship with him. And he was recently on josh's podcast which is the secret sauce podcast if you haven't listened to it go to apple Podcasts or spotify and check it out um because the ryan leak episode and all the episodes are awesome but ryan leak says i'm willing to fail at stuff most people aren't even willing to try right and so if you adopt this mindset right if you have a framework like the four p's that you can use and apply to any situation whether it's personally or professionally where you need to make change and then you have like a humble mindset or a meek mindset, meek being somebody who has courage, yet you're willing to be humble, right? And you're you're willing to, to fail, try, fail, and then learn from those failures and get better. There's no change that you can't overcome. So it's great to have a framework like the four Ps, but I think this really important epilogue to that is that you've got to be willing to fail. And that, re that requires some things like humility, um, openness and stuff like that, that I'm sure, you know, Ryan in his book, Chasing Failure, you know, Swing, you, you've, you've read about. Yeah, definitely. Even going back to what you mentioned and the difference between the people who fail and succeed, and it's, it was their ability to learn quickly from the mistakes that were, they're making, uh, a common saying that you hear is experience is the best teacher. The best, the best teacher is experience. Like they just need to do it. And that's partially true, but John Maxwell would say reflected experience is the best teacher. Like the people who are willing to think about the reasons that things didn't go the way that they should have gone or the things did go the way that they should have gone are typically the ones that succeed long-term because they're, they're adapting quickly because they're taking the time to actually think about and not just mindlessly doing something over and over and over again. So yeah, I mean huge Brian league fan. I think he's, he's a phenomenal thought leader here in the space. And we're, uh, we're definitely grateful to get to call him friend. He's taught me a ton. He's taught our team a ton, but the, yeah, I mean, what you said, Rachel hit me just right between the eyes. It's the courage plus the humility. I just think back to even when I started the podcast that Ryan Leak was on and like, I was had the internal dialogue going of like, what if I'm, terrible at this and everybody thinks that i'm the worst podcast host in the world and really like what was getting in the way of me doing the thing that would ultimately add a lot of value to other people was my personal pride it was because there was a lack of humility there to say let's just try it and and 
that's a challenge for a lot of people is a fear of what other people think. There's a lot of other fears that exist out there, but man, if you'll just approach it and do it, and even if you're scared, Ryan Link would say, just do it scared and see what happens. Really big things will happen. You'll be able to add value to people in a super dynamic way. Hampton's coming off because he's so fired up. So I'm going to let him add it. <laughs> do it scared, fam. Come on, do it scared. That's good. Uh, wow. And also, how much easier is it to step out and, and do something that you're a little scared to do with other people? At Wild Spark, we always say growth happens best in the context of community where you can learn from other people, where you can realize that you're not the only one that's scared, where you can have accountability, <clears throat> excuse me, where you can have accountability in place. And guys, that's a that's a huge part of what we do at WildSpark. I mean, that is so much of, of our goal is to, yes, give you good and meaningful content, but that resonates with you, but then help you put that into action. Because there's a really big difference. Rachel hit on this a minute ago, but um, just because something's interesting to us, just because it resonates with us, we tell ourselves that because it's interesting and it's resonating, we're, we're making change and putting it into action. But but we're often not. It's like, oh, oh, that that video with that motivational music in the background or that quick clip I saw, that felt good in the moment, but did I actually do anything? And most people aren't going to do something on their own. They're going to, they need a team of people. And so that's what we're doing at WildSpark um, for lots of organizations. And so imagine a world in which each month you're doing a lesson on a topic. In this case, it could be on leading change. We have a, a three-month unit that goes through that. And so you would do a lesson where you can personally do some reflection. You might watch some of those videos with the music in the background that get your emotions stirring and get you thinking. But then just to make sure that you grow as much as you can and put some of those things into action, you would come together with your team at the end of that month and have a conversation about it. And just imagine meeting month over month over month with that team. You're going to build a lot of trust and you're going to hold each other accountable. And that's really what we're trying to do here is just tee you up to have conversations uh, like like I feel like we're having through a screen right now uh, with each other so that you can grow. Uh, so so again, I mean, we'll we'll talk more about this later on another webinars. But but if you have any more interest in learning what that does look like with WildSpark, we're um, just just a phone call or a, or a little LinkedIn message away. Yeah. And uh, just to add to that, right, like I think the best way to create an environment and a culture where you can implement change, you can implement it easily or you can at least implement it in a way where there's that support that you need to fail fast and iterate fast. You have to have a culture that's relational over transactional. And I, the reason I say that is because you have to value your people first for who they are, not for what they do for you. And if you value your people first and foremost for who they are, then there's there's a, this complete safety net for them to be able to take risks, to make change, to fail, to be supported, then in, in, in kind of have that group collaboration and to then be able to iterate on it quickly, make a change. And I'll share this really quick story before we close out here. So I'm renovating one of my bathrooms and... I wish I had it, but I, but I've started this project and now I have to finish it. Right. And so one night I was painting after my kids went to bed and I accidentally spilled some paint on the floor and I was so upset about it. And I was sitting there sort of having a pity party about it. And then like, I heard the voice of my boss, Corey Tao, who's the coolest person ever and the best boss in the world at Wild Spark. And I heard him say something to me that he said to me before in our one-on-one -on -one meetings, it was like, okay, what happened? Is it the end of the world? Can it be fixed? Or do we need to scrap it? Okay, how can it be fixed? Okay, let's do that and move forward, right? And so when you as a leader, like you create a safe environment for people to bring their whole selves to work. And when you create a safe environment for people to not be afraid to change, to implement change, to fail fast, to learn fast from it and move forward, when you create that type of culture that we at WildSpark with our platform try to really infuse and instill into your company values and your culture, man, change just becomes, it takes, it takes change from being a mountain to a molehill, right? And so approaching change as a team, approaching personal development and leadership development as a team is a game changer. And so that's why we do these webinars to try and just, to just encourage as many people as we can that these types of topics that we discuss, they are always supercharged when you do them as a team. That's good. 
the uh the whole African proverb, you wanna go fast, go alone, you wanna go far, do it together. It's just like playing in my mind, Rachel, as you were talking about that. Yeah. It's a good one. But yeah, guys, I mean, we're gonna do this again next month. Like we've been showing up every month. We're so excited to get to interact with you and just kind of pour out some of the things that we've learned from Wild Spark. And I'm excited about next month's webinar. Hampton, what do you think? I think, sorry, I couldn't get myself off mute, that I'm extremely excited. We love our friends over at Nectar. They're doing a lot of amazing things. Uh, we have similar goals for for organizations. And so we're, we're going to have a good one. It's going to be a good time. They're bringing a lot of awesome people to come talk to. So uh, y'all make sure to not miss, miss this one. Yeah. Come back next month. Join us for this awesome webinar with our friends at Nectar. And then if you uh, want to chat about your current leadership strategy or culture or anything at all, our team is here for you. We'll tell you all about going far together. Yeah. <laughs> this is good. I, uh, I've had a blast. I've, I've even personally like started thinking about pinpointing some pain in my life and what needs to change right now. So this has been an even a great conversation selfishly for me as everybody's hopping off today. I know we're, we're giving everybody a little bit of time back, which is always the best gift to have a little bit more space in your day. But I'd love to hear in the chat if anybody's willing to share what were some of the highlights for you as you're going through today, the incompatible wishes that Hampton talked about and the four P's and maybe it was one in particular P or maybe it was the whole mentality on chasing failure and what does it look like to succeed in light of failure. We'd love to hear anybody's big takeaways as you're hopping off our LinkedIn Live Friday lunch webinar extravaganza. Yeah, and shout out to our friends at Bank Independent for having lunch with us. We love you guys. Oh, yeah. Mm. The only thing that would have made today be better is pizza. If we would have like, somehow had pizza for everybody in the webinar, that would have been epic. That would have been bomb. We have to figure out a way to do that over time. If you sign up for the webinar, we'll send you lunch. Ooh. Someday. Someday, guys. All right, guys. Well, it's been great hanging out with you. Um, you can still drop anything that you want in the comments and we'll be able to see it over time. This, this webinar will live on LinkedIn. So if you want to see it in the future or you want to send it to anybody, all you gotta do is go to our LinkedIn page and it'll be there. Uh, we're grateful for you signing off. Have a great weekend. Ooh, ooh. Have a good one.